The Nuts and Bolts of Writing, Season Two, a podcast where we talk about literature, the ins and outs of writing, and how to actually start writing. Hi, everyone. Today we have an amazing guest, writer and podcaster Serena Longer. I've previously been on her podcast, the Writing Sparrow Podcast, which is all about writing, publishing, and marketing your book. It's a great resource for indie writers of all stripes. On her podcast, I talked about how to write and publish graphic novels. Since I've published two graphic novels, The Book of Joel and Sam New York, I've included links in the description. So, on to our guest's bio. Serena is a dark fantasy author of both epic and urban paranormal novels. In her free time, she usually reads one audiobook, one ebook, and one paperback. Plays video games and obsesses over mythology. She has a weakness for books on writing and pretty words. You can follow her on Twitter at Serena underscore Longer. Today, we'll be talking to Serena about her upcoming books. So, Serena. Welcome to the podcast. Oh goodness, thank you! What an introduction. <laughs> hey, Imelda, happy to be here. So exciting. I know it's amazing. You know, I, <laughs> I love you know, interviewing a very wide variety of <laughs> authors, and you were one of the first people I thought of when you know creating the list of people I will be interviewing in season two. Oh, thank you. Probably yes. helped that we were just recording from my podcast at the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So we're going to be asking four questions, and the first one is: Can you tell us about your current projects? What books are you working on, and which will be released in the next several months? Oh boy. Okay. So that's actually quite a big question because I always have several projects on the go at once. So today I outlined two stories, which will be anthology submissions. Um, I am currently editing the second book in the Chaos, um, sorry, Chaos of Esther Anderson series, which I can write, but I can't pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I am about to, well, I say I'm about to publish two anthologies. I'm part of two anthologies, which will be publishing over the next two months. So it's a busy time. <laughs> That's really exciting. You know, it's really, really awesome when you have so many projects going on at once. You know, it really. I also encourages... just published one. So. <laughs> oh, awesome! Yeah, Great. it's a lot. It's a lot happening at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting time. <laughs> which which project um are you currently working on that takes up most of your time? I think that will probably be split between the two anthology submissions and the book I'm currently editing. So the one I'm editing is the second book in the, get it right this time, Chaos of <laughs> Esther Anderson series. Yes. <laughs> um, so that one is going really smoothly and I'm really enjoying it, but it's also longer than the first book was. So, you know, even though the edits are going pretty well, it's still a longer book. Um, well, longer than the first one anyway. It's still relatively short. It'll be around 80,000 words. So mm -hmm. I'm not throwing a massive chunker off a book at you. So, <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, it's editing. It's the first big edit. So that always takes a while because it's the first time I'm going, you know, I'm coming back to the first draft. And then the two anthology submissions, there's one out in April. That one's for charity, by the way. <laughs> That's the twice upon a name story. Uh so yeah, the anthology is called Twice Upon a Name. We've done one last year called Once Upon a Name. And they are both for charity. And my story is set in the same world, actually, as the Chaos of Esther Anderson series. So if you love that one, you like that story as well. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one, the other anthology will be out in May. That's about shifters who can't shift. And that's just gone to my editor. So I'm very thrilled that's off my desk. <laughs> So can you tell us a bit more about the Chaos of Esther Anderson series? What kind of world does it take place in? And, you know, what is the general gist of the series? Oh, boy, the general gist of it. Oh, dear. You know, when you get asked what your book is about and you don't actually know. <laughs> 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 so the first book of that came out last year. It's set in our world, but 
you've also got vampires in there and werewolves and magic in general so that's in hopefully it's an exciting setting it's actually kind of set in my general neighborhood because I know this place and I know what I'm writing about and it's super <laughs> easy to research because I can just go to places <laughs> <laughs> um, but the overall premise of the story is that Esther has completely accidentally uncovered that magic exists and that she can now see vampires and fairies and they don't necessarily like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, most of the first book deals with how she adjusts to suddenly knowing all this and how she handles them or the vampires and general magical creatures not necessarily wanting her to know about this and what happens when someone comes after her to can i swear on your podcast yes you can to fuck shit up thanks <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely i mean it makes sense for the first book to be focused on that because that is a lot and you know that immerses us in the world and you know that is a lot of stuff that she has to learn, realizing that the world isn't what you think it is and suddenly pulled into this intrigue and finding herself in this situation that she would have never thought would exist. And it's terrifying. Yeah. So Esther has always, it, it's kind of a sort of be careful what you wish for thing because mm -hmm. Esther has always wanted magic to exist and then suddenly, bam, there it is and it's coming after her. So, <laughs> You know, it gets it gets a bit hairy for her, but Esther is a natural lucid dreamer. So this is something that she does every night. She wakes up in her dreams and she controls stuff in there. And the main antagonist for the first book comes after her in her dreams and turns them into nightmares. So, <laughs> I, yeah, I could do a lot with that because for it to be a nightmare that's supposed to put her off you know, wanting to see magic, it had to be something that it's pretty damn hard or else it wouldn't have worked. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was, that was, that, yeah, it has a few fun scenes that I've written in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gave me a free copy of the book and I've been reading it so far. And I love how you describe, you know, her life and her dissatisfaction with her life so far. And, you know, oh, you. the sibling rivalry or <laughs> and slash friendship was really well written. You know, I, I can totally relate to how, you know, you feel like your sister or brother is, you know, progressing better in your life than yourself. It can really make you really <laughs> depressed. And, you know, I can totally understand why Esther wants to have, you know, magic because she feels like her life is so dull. Yeah, it's just something that she's always felt must exist. I think for her, it's more that it feels like it's kind of weird that it doesn't exist like it should, like something is missing. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like when you see something just from the, you know, out of the corner of your eyes. That's a thing, right? So, <laughs> yeah, so she kind of feels like it should exist. And then when she realizes it actually it does, it's a big change to her routine, that's for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm, right. The lucid dreaming concept is really intriguing to me, too, because, um, you know, I actually I think I've had some lucid dreams before. Mm -hmm. And I was like thinking about what to do in those dreams. I'm like, can I influence how this dream progresses? And oh, I think yeah. in one of them, because I was about to wake up, it was in that weird dream state where you are about to wake up and you kind of realize your dream's not real yes at that point you can kind of control some of the stuff in your dream at least for me it sometimes works that way I mean for Esther this is a very easy and natural thing to do and obviously the whole series is fiction but lucid dreaming is something that anyone can do and you can kind of feel when you're about to wake up which is you know, once you're in the dream, it's really weird to realize that you're dreaming because it doesn't feel like a dream. It feels like any normal everyday situation. So to then accept that actually it is just a dream can feel really weird because it feels like this moment does right now. It doesn't feel like anything different. So mm -hmm. Esther has a massive advantage there. <laughs> yes, she does. And I think another interesting about dreams is that even if they're very, very ridiculous, <laughs> when you're experiencing it, it just feels normal. But then yes. when you're about to wake up, you're like, wait, this doesn't make sense. You know, why Why <laughs> does that building look like that? Or, you know, why is this happening? This shouldn't be happening. <laughs> and that's when yeah. you start realizing <laughs> that you are in a dream. I think the first lucid dream that I had where I remembered to do a reality check, I looked at my hands and I basically, I had 10 fingers on every hand. I say every hand, like I have more than two. <laughs> and they were kind of um, color, like rainbow colored. 
like every finger was a different color and it kind of followed the rainbow and because it's a dream and it feels real I still thought I mean it looks weird but this isn't a dream it can't be <laughs> like this is my bed and it wasn't but <laughs> yeah so yeah it's an it's an interesting thing to try and do Mm -hmm. but she can do it I believe in you <laughs> and I've got a guide to how to do it at the end of the book if anyone wants to try oh that's so fascinating I love that so what's the second book going to be about no spoilers obviously because it's still in no. the works but like yes. what is the general what what does Esther find out in the second book like, no, no details just like one sentence <laughs> um in the second book Esther will think that she is cursed and she will uh, find out some interesting stuff about herself which is very vague but I don't want to spoil it because it's such a big moment in the book and she has to put up with one jealous vampire mm. sounds scary <laughs> I hope so <laughs> <We'll see. laughs> yeah you shouldn't mess with vampires so that sounds pretty yeah. terrifying <laughs> <laughs> and she'll also learn how to read tarot so that was fun to write and there'll be a small introduction at the end of that book for that like Ooh. we have for Lisa dreaming in the first one I love that you know I, I love how you tie it in with things that we could actually do in real life it makes it very engaging and makes us want to learn more about the topic kind of like how Esther you know buys a book about lucid dreaming at that little bookstore you know with the old man yes. Yes. I love the little bookstore <laughs> <laughs> me too <laughs> So second question, how would you describe the process of releasing a book? Uh, as a massive learning curve to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> so it depends probably very strongly on how often you've done this already. So for your first book, as I said, this is going to be a huge learning curve because you won't know what you're doing. And if you say just google how do i publish a book you will find a ton of probably conflicting information and you know one website will tell you you have to do it exactly this way and then another website will tell you the exact opposite or it will give you some extra steps that the first one didn't include so <laughs> it's a bit of a minefield um so it's i mean it's it's quite easy really when you break it down but for the most part it's really just a matter of trial and error and then, you know, what doesn't work, you don't do again next time, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so it's it's really exciting and it's really nerve wracking. Um, and in the case of the last book that I've just published a few weeks ago, it's, it can also be a massive relief. So it's it's a bit of everything. <laughs> right. Uh, how do you describe um, the, right, uh, the editing process? Like you, you said you had an editor. Do you think that do you edit it before you send it to your editor? And like, how did you find your editor? And how how would you say your relationship is with your editor? So that's changed a lot since I started. Um, when, when I published my first book back in 2016, I didn't know that critique partners were a thing. I did have beta readers, but I had way too many. So just for anyone listening, 12 is too many. If you don't need 12 beta readers, that's mad. Um, <laughs> And I only actually got a proofread at the time. I didn't know that developmental edits were a thing or that line edits were really that necessary. And trust me, they really are. Don't skim on the line edits or copy edits. You definitely need those. So a few years later, I actually went back in and I redid it. I re-edited everything. And I asked my editor at the time to basically go back in and do a massive copy edit. And I redid everything. Um, because again, it's a huge learning curve and I didn't know any better with my first book so now if you buy it now I promise you it's much cleaner <laughs> mm -hmm. right I think having you know this uh, third party look over your work is really helpful yeah and just my general approach to editing has changed a lot so the book that I've just published is my 10th book um so that it's been a busy few years of basically trying everything and just hopefully growing a lot as an author so what I do now is I always let my first draft rest for a few months, at least if I can, because um, it helps you come back to it and at least sort of half see it with new eyes. You can never do this completely because obviously you've written it, but I find the more distance you can put your, between yourself and the first draft being finished really helps when you go back in. And then I do the first big edit 
um, depending on how smooth the first draft already is, this can take a while. <laughs> and, you know, this this is normally where you find things like plot holes and paradoxes and all that fun stuff, which could completely invalidate the entire book. <laughs> so that's huge fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then once that is done, I send it to critique partners and then they get it back to me with their ideas and suggestions. I implement everything that I think helps the book and then I might give it another pass depending on how rough the first draft has been and also if I have the energy left for it at that point <laughs> so with Blood Vow I definitely did and that was a nightmare <laughs> and, and then I sent it to my editor for a copy edit normally it's a copy edit um, what I tend to do now with my new editor as of Blood Song is I send her the book I say go over this tell me what you think it needs and then that's what we're doing so I have complete uh, complete trust in Ray. If Ray tells me it needs a developmental edit, then that's what we're doing. And if she says it only needs to proofread, then that's what's happening. I think trust with an editor is extremely important. Definitely. Yes. And this is possibly something that all authors need to hear, really. If you, if you want to work with an editor, you want to work well, and you should work with an editor anyway, um, it's really, really important that you get along. Because mm -hmm. if you can't trust your editor with your writing, then... Don't hire them. Basically. <laughs> you know, it's it's really very straightforward. And all editors, as a general rule, tend to offer a free sample edit. So you don't need to commit immediately to someone you don't even know. Definitely ask for a sample edit. And if they are not prepared to do that, then move on and ask a different editor. It's very easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you find your editors? Is it through a specific platform, through Twitter or through trusted friends? I've been really lucky with mine. My first editor I found on Twitter, I think we were already talking at the time, and I realized that I was ready for an editor. I started talking to Brianna, and then I realized that she was an editor, and I asked her if she could do my book. So that was really lucky. And then my second editor, who I'm working with now, Ray, um, it pretty much found in exactly the same way. We'd already been talking a little bit on Twitter anyway, and then many of my author friends also recommended her so I thought well this is easy <laughs> right it is so and we also happen to work really well together so that definitely helps again if you don't work well with your editor don't work with them find somebody <laughs> else definitely yeah that is great advice I think sometimes you know having this already existing relationship with them on Twitter makes it easier to gouge whether they would be a good fit. Whether if you go yeah. through a platform, it's more depersonalized. So it's harder to understand whether they would be a good fit for your book. Yes. And as writers, you're probably already on social media anyway. You might not be, but you probably are somewhere. And there's a good chance that editors will also be hanging out somewhere on the same social media platform. And you might even already be talking to some. So you know, just start seeing if you get along. And if you do get along really well and you're ready for an editor, just ask them if they are free. But also don't leave this to the last second because editors do get booked up in advance. And if you need an editor now, like right now, and you only choose this moment to ask if they are free, then chances are you'll be missing out. So, you know, start talking early. Mm -hmm. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Yes, definitely. Number three, how did you find releasing a digital book versus releasing a physical copy? Easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, both of them I find quite easy, to be honest. I'm publishing um, ebooks, paperbacks, and hardbacks via KDP on Amazon. And then my ebooks are also available wide via Draft to Digital. And I mean, ebooks are definitely a little bit easier because you don't have to check the physical copy to make sure it's okay. And with your ebook, you don't get KDP coming back to you and saying that the cover is the wrong size, even though you haven't changed anything and it was fine yesterday, which happens mm -hmm. too often, especially with one book more than others for no reason and we can't figure out why. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's something that can complicate it but fortunately my cover designer and my formatter are very lovely and they they are very aware that kdp can sometimes get a bit uppity with this shall we say so mm -hmm. they know it's nothing personal when i come back and say becky james they've done it again but <laughs> um 
But otherwise, it's really easy to publish both. And then if you're already getting a paperback and you think you might also like a hardback, then that's very easy to tag on as well. Just ask your formatter to do both. Um, mm -hmm. See if there's a different price. And I mean, it's probably a tiny bit more, but generally hardbacks are just a little bit bigger than your paperbacks. So it doesn't take a lot to adjust. And you basically apply to everything in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. So... It's kind of exactly the same, except potentially a little bit more of a headache, depending on how KDP is feeling that day. But for the most part, it's been fine and exactly the same. I really think Amazon KDP has really been a godsend for a lot of writers. You know, with yes. so many tools on it, it's so much easier to publish than, you know, in the past when you had to physically contact, you know, these people to print out books mm -hmm. and then you have to find a way to mail it to people. Yeah, that gets very expensive very quickly. I mean, you can totally still do that. But, you know, if this is your first book and you don't really know what you're doing yet, maybe don't start with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, make it easier for yourself. Because as you said, this is going to be such a big learning curve anyway. So don't make it harder than it has to be. And, you know, you will learn along the way either way, hopefully. I would really hope so. Um, <laughs> if you're not learning anything at all from publishing your first book, you're doing it wrong and you've missed something somewhere. I guarantee you. So, um, yeah, it's really pretty easy. And what I also like about KDP is if you've already uploaded your ebook, then the information like the blurb and all that gets copied over to your paperback and your hardback. So there's a lot of information you don't need to enter a second or a third time. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. audio books are a different monster altogether in some different alternate reality that you can't deal with KDP you need a whole different site for that so <laughs> yeah but that's fun too <laughs> oh yes audiobooks so do you mm. do you record them yourself or do you get someone else to read them mm. out how does it work so I would love to do my own audiobooks and I would love to do voice acting but I'm worried that me doing accents might cause a diplomatic incident so I'm not gonna <laughs> um and also, it's really, really hard work. So if I may just briefly plug my own podcast, I've had Dana Friedrich on there a few times, and she's done basically every single approach to audiobook production. She's done it herself. Her husband has done the audiobook editing. Um, she's worked with other people. She's used um, different platforms for this. And basically just the audio book editing the sound editing takes roughly three times as long as just recording the damn thing in the first place and just that recording isn't really something that you can just power through in a day or two because talking this much takes a massive strain on your voice it's exhausting so um i think i'm better off writing another book in that time <laughs> and i'm so i'm working with narrators to read my books for me which is really great when you listen to something that you've written and you get auditions for something that you've made. Like, damn, somebody wants to read this and they're auditioning? <laughs> wow, okay, cool. Let's let's listen to this and see who's the right fit. <laughs> and um, one note on there, please give your narrators a ton of grace because as you've just said, this is really, really exhausting work. It's a massive strain on your voice. And just the audiobook um, editing in itself is not as straightforward as written word editing. So if your narrator needs a bit more time, please don't be a bitch about it. <laughs> please work <laughs> with them. They are people. So, yeah, it's always quite sad when my narrators come back to me and say, oh, my God, you're being so nice to work with. If you're not being mean when I can't meet a deadline right away so come on they have people they have other things to do as well and if equipment breaks it breaks what are they supposed to do I mean obviously they'll replace it but you know stuff happens so mm -hmm. yes I Please totally agree with respect it's hard <laughs> it is I never thought about it that way but now you now that you've broken it down it, it does seem very complex especially since you know the average audiobook mm -hmm. is like you know six hours or maybe even 10 hours depending on the length of the book oh yeah the longest one I've ever had on audible is 30 hours long oh my god so that's that's a lot of hours of basically talking and you can't just talk as you normally would you know it's effectively voice acting you have to emote you have to put a lot of feeling into that every character sounds different and then there's accents that come in there and 
you know, you kind of just have to think on your feet as you're recording, you know, from going from one voice to another one. And then maybe the descriptions are in a more generic accent and voice. So it's it's really hard work. And all narrators deserve our greatest respect and kindness. Thank you. Really mm -hmm. appreciate it. <laughs> yes, it, it does sound very exhausting because you have to think about how each character is differentiated from the other ones so yes thank yeah. you voice actors you know you guys are <laughs> you know amazing I feel slightly guilty that my um, narrator Adrian R.C. for my Bloodwist trilogy um, she has so many different female characters to narrate and I just said to her I don't know how you're basically going to do like 20 different female voices but good luck to you girl I believe in you <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> So finally, <laughs> how do you approach marketing when it comes to your books? How do you pump up hype for your books? And what role does social media and newsletters play in marketing? So this comes at a great time because I've just left Instagram basically completely. And I'm not doing the whole TikTok thing because I've tried it and it's exhausting and I don't have the energy for it. And I know that a lot of authors rely heavily on Instagram and TikTok. And I'm not one of you. So um, I know that those can work really, really great, but they weren't for me. So I can't help on that. <laughs> um, I mostly now just use Twitter and Facebook. And on Facebook, it's really mostly my reader group and m more recently my street team. I don't do an awful lot else on that, to be honest. So really, you just show up a little bit every day. Twitter is really laid back about this. You don't have to be there for hours at a time to get anything out of this, which is one of the reasons why I love Twitter. Um, you know, just just post every now and again, talk to other people, obviously just be your wonderful self, <laughs> assuming <laughs> that you're all wonderful people. And, you know, when, when it comes time to release a book, then hopefully the friends that you've made on there and your new connections will help you automatically in sharing that information and the links and the pretty graphics you've probably made. So... You know, Twitter is one of the easier things for that. And there's also paid promotions that you can do. There's a few different free tactics that you can try. Free tactics are great because they are free. So it it costs you absolutely bugger rule to at least try it and just see what happens. And then if that doesn't work, it doesn't matter because you haven't spent anything. So you haven't lost anything except maybe a tiny bit of time. And um definitely don't overspend on an expensive promotion if you can't afford it because you may never make that money back and you probably won't unless it's a book bub feature deal in which case you probably will and they're awesome but also hard to get and then with my newsletter I have very recently completely overhauled how I approach that so I can't really say it how it's going to go with the next book because again it's very recent that I've overhauled it um, I put the last touches on the new welcome sequence literally yesterday at mm. the point of recording this. So we will see how this plays out when the next book releases. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then we'll see if it helps, hopefully. <laughs> how about real life events? Like, for example, joining a local like writer's club or, you know, going to a book fair and setting up a <laughs> stand with your books. Does that work? Or do you think that's kind of outdated now? I mean, I think it probably depends as of everything. That's the fun thing about this business. There is no one size fits all kind of stuff. Um, and I'm possibly not the best person to talk about this because I've only really done one event. I've done one book fair in Brighton, um, which was really fun. And it's not that I haven't tried to arrange others because, because it didn't go too well. <laughs> but it's you know you, you need to factor in how many books you might want to buy to bring to the event with you you have to consider how you're going to get there how much it's going to cost you and I think pretty much every author is going to tell you that you will not make your money back on the event because the table itself costs you money as well obviously um, if you're sharing the table it might be a bit cheaper but it depends strongly on the organizer and the <laughs> fun thing that I had on the day is that the event was definitely publicized as sort of family friendly event with lots of genres being present and then we get there we set up the table 
my partner goes around everything comes back to me and just says did you know it was going to be all porn and no i did not know this imelda this was news to me so <laughs> so that was a great family friendly event where i'd say probably about 80 percent of covers had naked men on them so it wasn't i at the time i think i had maybe three or four books out and they were all epic fantasy i didn't have smut in any of them which you know chaos of esther anderson is now slowly building up to but at the time i didn't so yeah given the 80 percent smutty book representation we were very out of place and the poor lady i was sharing a table with just had an autobiography and you know we didn't really fit there which we didn't know going in but you know um definitely scope out any event first that you think you might like to attend as an author go as a reader first see if it's your kind of thing see if it's definitely your demographic i didn't do this stupid idea <laughs> <laughs> and you know just just see if your books would fit in there talk to some authors who have attended it talk to some readers who are going ask them what they are looking for and i mean always do your research that was many years ago i've published so many books since then and now Every, I mean, every now and again, people will ask me if I might do another event. And it really depends. Again, it depends. Mm -hmm. Because you need to bring, obviously, copies of your books. But you can't bring too many, you know. You, you have to carry them. You have to get them there somewhere. You may have to get a banner printed. You're going to have to have other merchandise on your table. It can't just be books. You know, maybe you want to have bookmarks there or mugs or dice or whatever. Something that fits your book. You know, something that's in line with your genre and it's it's a lot of effort for potential and just maybe sitting or standing around at this event all day maybe eight hours and you might not really get that much back out of it we had one guy i remember who came up to me no it was one woman who came up to me and said that she was making a note of all these books written by female authors in her husband's favorite genre because he wouldn't read female authors and she was going to surprise him with a kindle full of female authors i was like okay <laughs> good luck with that i hope it goes well uh i don't know how it went um seemed risky to me i, I can't say but <laughs> so yeah yeah it was interesting um one of my friends in america dana again dana Friedrich. she goes i swear she goes to a different event every weekend I cannot imagine how exhausting that must be. It's probably not quite that many, but she goes to a lot. <laughs> I think in one year she went to 20 or something ridiculous like that. So, and you know, this being America, they all really spread out too. And wow. you have to consider how you're going to get there. <laughs> mm -hmm. We had some people at the Brighton event who had flown over from America. So you don't have to do that, but, you know, definitely consider if it's going to be worth the expense for you because it will be one hell of an expense and it's unlike you'll make the money back <laughs> yeah it seems more of a fun thing and also a photo op kind of like a marketing thing yes. where you can say yay i'm here and I'm, i met this author and then they make you know a video and like, a ton of photos and it also yes. kind of makes you look more legitimate because for a lot of older yeah. people or you know people in general i think they see like a hard copy book as you know quote unquote more legitimate though that is yes. slowly changing yeah slowly but it's getting there and i mean i think it can be a fantastic way to spend your day if you're an extrovert and love people and socializing which is not me so i was very drained at the end of the day it was a lot so if you're anti-social like me it may not be your kind of thing that's okay there's other stuff you can do <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This was a very enlightening <laughs> talk. And, you know, we learned so much about the publishing process and your books and so much other stuff. You know, guys, please check out the links in the description to learn more about Serena's books and, you know, her podcast and also her Twitter. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Bye. Bye.